Today, I kind of wanted to do a follow-up video to the one I did on guys that I think are safe draft picks in the 2022 draft. But wait, before you leave to go watch that video, just know, okay, you know what, just, just stay, watch this one first. That video is not required viewing or anything like that. There's no lore, no background information you need to know. It's all good. You could watch this one to the end of course and then go check that one out if you want to see the safe guys but uh yeah this video will be on guys that i think are risky picks in the 2022 draft and we're gonna get started right away with matthew savoy but before i get into savoy i just want to very quickly explain what a risky pick is in my opinion and that's just a guy who doesn't really have a safe floor at the NHL level. These are guys that very well could not play in the NHL at all, or maybe they get a cup of coffee, they don't work out, and uh, that's and that's it. However, these are also generally guys that have pretty high upsides. Basically, you could think of these guys as boom or bust type players. The first one of these players that I want to talk about is, as I mentioned earlier, Matthew Savoy. Now, Savoy is not very big. In fact, some would say he is small. Standing at 5'9", or at least he is listed at 5'9", on EliteProspects.com, and some sources say he is actually even shorter than that, but he's a hockey 5'9", if you will. But that isn't the only thing that worries me about him. A lot of his production this year came on the power play. He didn't score at an exceptionally high rate uh, at 5-on-5. Five five. His passing, in my opinion, is kind of mediocre. But the skills are there. He is not great under pressure either, which is why I think he really thrives on the power play there's more open space less likelihood of him being directly challenged by a bigger player and that's kind of the name of the game in the nhl so at higher levels of hockey that he's going to be playing you know in the ahl and then eventually the nhl hopefully he's going to be facing stronger bigger faster competition that are going to be pressuring him a lot quicker than he's used to at this level in the whl and he's already not the best at resisting that pressure so that is my main concern with savoy if it works out and he gets better at resisting pressure maybe he gets a little bit stronger maybe he gets a little bit taller who knows uh then he could become a very very uh, good player in the NHL because like I said the skills are there the stick skills his shot his deceptiveness his stick handling like it's all there all the tools are there for a gifted uh, point producer at the NHL level but his size and his resiliency could hold him back from making the NHL at all which is why he is perhaps the most high-profile risky pick in the 2022 draft. The next player I want to talk about is a guy that I have talked about a lot, and if you are a veteran of this channel, you would know that I really love this guy, and that is Finnish forward Brad Lambert. So why am I considering Lambert a risky pick if I like him so much? Well, the simple matter of the fact is he did not produce in the Liga this year. That will raise a lot of alarms with a lot of scouts. Now, I always emphasize process over results, and with Lambert, I do think the process is good, but he has had multiple chances on different teams, right? I know he was traded halfway through this season, so he played for two different teams in the Liga this year, and his production did not improve with the new team granted both teams were kind of bad but still so you can't really say oh it's a system thing because he played in two different systems although maybe both teams systems sucked uh i think that is actually part of it but 
Still, it is a reason to be concerned. And I believe he actually played on a third different team uh, the year previously. So then you're kind of getting into the conversation of, well, is this guy like a locker room problem? Does he have personality issues where he's not meshing with his teammates really well? Like, why is he getting traded so often? And I think a large part of that is just because he's trying to find a good team. Him and his agent are trying to find a place where he can succeed and raise his profile. And supposedly, he is strongly considering coming over to the WHL next season. And at this point, I think that that might be really good for his development. But in any case, uh, he is a guy that has a lot of skill. Uh, he's not small like a lot most of the other guys on this list. So he doesn't really have small player problems. But he does he does lack the raw production. A lot of statistical models, I imagine, like uh, I believe Patrick Bacon's model is one of the really popular ones for prospects, are probably going to be really low on Lambert because they are primarily based on points production. And yes, uh, European pro leagues are historically tough for prospects to score in, but even then, this guy put up like four points or nine points or something like that this year. It's not the point production that you would expect from a player that, in my eyes, is easily top three in his draft class. The third player I want to talk about is the third and final forward on this list, and that is Jagger Fergus. So Fergus is another high-skilled guy who is small. He has a really good shot, in my opinion. His skating is good enough. But again, he's not that resilient under pressure. And again, just like with guys like Matthew Savoy, if he does not get better at resisting uh, at resisting pressure, or at least creating space for himself so he's not in pressure in the first place, it's not going to get any easier at higher levels of hockey. Uh, it's it's going to get harder. So for him to really succeed at the next level, he's going to have to get stronger. He's going to have to find ways to evade and or resist pressure better. And also, I think if he really wants his production to uh, translate to the next level of hockey, he's going to have to work on his passing as well. Because right now, he's kind of a volume passer. He does pass a lot, but his passing completion rates are pretty low. So... I do like his positioning. I think he's really good at finding soft areas of the ice in the offensive zone, both at 5-on-5 five five and on the power play, and that's really why I really like him so much. But you're going to have to make really high-quality passes for them to work out at the NHL level. So that, combined with the size issue, is really what brings Fergus down to, like, a mid to late first round pick at best. Okay, so I still have several players I want to talk about, and there's one thing they all have in common. They are, well, most of them have in common, I should say. They are undersized defensemen. I'm not sure if it's just me or 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 what, but it it seems like there are a lot of highly rated undersized defensemen in this draft. I mean, you have Nemec, uh, Juracek, and like Korchinski, which are generally like the top three. But after that, a lot of these defensemen seem to be undersized. And that'll start with uh, Seamus Casey. So Casey is 5'10". So he's not the smallest guy on this list. We'll get to him later. But he is still undersized especially for a defenseman 510 for a forward is undersized but it's not as big of a deal as it is for a defenseman just because uh your reach is more limited as a defenseman and that is more important than if you are a forward because you're actually supposed to be playing defense uh but yeah so casey the big thing that worries me about him is his skating he isn't exactly a bad skater 
But if you're going to be a successful undersized defenseman in the NHL, you have to be really agile, really quick on your feet because you have to be able to, one, resist pressure, just like all these other guys. Resisting pressure is going to be a big issue. And two, you have to be able to pivot, turn, manage your gap controls, man, gap controls, you know what I mean. But it's just really important that you don't get taken out of the play as a defenseman. And that goes for both ways, but primarily on defense, of course. And at, it's harder for undersized defensemen to not get taken out of the play, especially if they're not great skaters. So the upside with Casey, though, is pretty high. I think he has really high potential when it comes to offense. Uh, I know he didn't produce a ton of points this year, but I know he had good underlying metrics. So if he can actually translate those metrics into production, then things should be pretty good as long as he can improve on his skating. The next defenseman I'm going to talk about is going to be North Bay Battalion defenseman Ty Nelson. Now, Nelson is 5'10", just like Seamus Casey. And with him, it isn't just the size either. He did not... To me, he's kind of a tough read. It didn't seem like he was really utilizing his strengths well this year. He seemed to play a really conservative style of hockey, which as an undersized defenseman, that, in my opinion, doesn't really work. The vast majority of the time, if you're an undersized defenseman in the NHL, you're probably bringing pretty good levels of offense because if you're like a two-way guy even, I mean, it's always good to be good defensively as well. So I guess I shouldn't mention two-way guys, but if you don't bring a lot of offense and you're primarily a, def a defensive guy, then why are teams going to play you ahead of another guy who is also defensively minded, is pretty much equally good at defending, but they're 6'4", you know? Bigger defensemen have bigger reaches. They can be more impactful physically. It's just the cards are kind of stacked against undersized defensemen, which is part of the reason, or the main reason, I should say, why I think that they are historically undervalued at the draft. So with Ty Nelson, he should really be going all out on offense. I mean, again, you do want to develop your defensive game, but especially in juniors, this is a time for offensive defensemen, especially smaller guys, to really hone in their craft when it comes to producing points because the younger they do that the better it's going to develop theoretically and hopefully that could actually end up translating to the NHL someday and they could worry about defense later right you could always uh, give them sheltered minutes early on in their career just put them like on the power play and then third pair uh, minutes at five on five kind of like a guy like Noah Dobson um, and things are good but it seems like Nelson is not really applying himself offensively the way I would hope. But uh, I don't know. He, he's a tough read for me. But again, undersized defenseman brings a lot of risk. The next guy I want to talk about is Lane Hudson. Now, Hudson seems to be flying up a lot of draft boards recently, and I kind of understand why. He is pure offense. Now, he is listed at 5'8", and that is really small, especially for a defenseman. I mean, how many 5'8 defensemen are in the league? Uh, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, to be honest. I know Nick Blankenberg, I believe, is 5'8". And he played a few games with Columbus at the end of the year, and he looked kind of promising, so he'll probably be around for at least a little while. But other than him, I'm sure there's a couple more, but they don't come to mind instantly. 
But with Lane Hudson, he is all offense all the time, and it's fantastic. Personally, I am a Sharks fan, and they do not have a second round pick, which kind of kills me because Hudson could be available early in the second round, and that would be a guy I would love them to target there. But really, any team in the late first round or into the second round, I think, should take a chance on this guy because, again, he is risky. He's really small, and that's really it with him. Small defensemen are risky, and they're also potentially going to be prone to injuries uh, because, you know, tall player hit guy in head, but not penalty because he's tall. You know, <clears throat> Jacob Truba looking at you. But, yeah, or Nikita, Z Nikita Zadorov as well. Um, but, yeah, I think the upside with Hudson is is really high. I think he could be a premier, like, top power play guy who puts up a ton of points every year. Maybe he's not good on defense, but who cares? He scored 20 goals in a season or something like that, you know. I don't necessarily see him as a big goal scorer in the NHL, but that was just an example. You know, if a defenseman puts up, any defenseman really puts up that many goals in a season, you don't really care too much about their defense, unless the rest of the team also sucks on defense and the defenseman's name is Brent Burns, and Burns is a lot taller than 5'8", so he uh, should maybe be a little bit more responsible defensively. The next guy I want to talk about is Tyler Duke. Now, Tyler Duke is listed at 5'9", so not quite as short at, as Hudson, but uh, still very short for a defenseman. And honestly, I don't really have that much to say about Tyler Duke. He's just another small defenseman who is offensively minded, has pretty good puck skills, and you never know, could could translate those to the NHL and be a pretty good uh, power play quarterback. Now, in general, I don't think there's a lot of upside with the defenseman in this class. I think outside of Juracek, Nemec, Korchinski, and then these guys, especially like Hudson and Casey, I don't think there's a ton of upside. So even like the best defenseman from this draft class might and might mostly end up being like second power play guys who put up like 40-ish points a season, which is still pretty respectable for a defenseman. But that just gives you an idea of my opinion about the, these guys' offensive potential in general. Finally, the last player I want to talk about is uh, Denton Matejchuk. So Matejchuk is pretty interesting. He is the tallest guy on this list at 5'11". So he's starting to breach the not small status. I mean, 5'11 is still undersized for a defenseman, in my opinion, but not by a ton. I mean, you think, oh, what's the difference between 5'10 and 5'11? Well, it's an inch. <laughs> But that inch does make a difference, supposedly at least. And I don't really think Matejchuk has small defenseman problems the way these other guys do. He just has a really interesting style of hockey that he plays. He is basically a third winger out there at times. At times, his defensive involvement can be pretty bad. Uh, his transition game at times can be pretty bad, but whenever he sees a opportunity to create offense, he will go for it, and he will be deep in the offensive zone for a extended period of time on any given shift if his team has possession in the offensive zone and he's trying to score. So he's not really your traditional you know, offensive defenseman who creates offense from the blue line and then like walking up like on the power play or whenever there's space given. No, he is constantly pinching, getting behind the goal line, even getting in front of the goal, going to like the dirty areas of the ice kind of, and honestly kind of playing like a forward. So there are a lot of times where that is going to bite him in the butt uh, on defense, especially 
when he plays higher levels of hockey because he is consistently behind his D partner and oftentimes forwards on his team at getting back on uh, defending rushes against. So that style of hockey is inherently risky for a defenseman. I would be interested to see what a team does with him who drafts him like do they move him to the wing i can i would consider that an actual legitimate option with him or do they let him play his style and just hope it works out do they try to coach his style out of him because i don't know how it would work at the nhl level um but yeah like all those questions just really to me make him a pretty risky pick now again with all these guys it's not all bad. Like, these guys all are incredibly skilled. If, I mean, some of them are more skilled than others, but generally speaking, if any of these guys hit, I think they're going to be really solid contributors at the NHL level. So that's why you draft them, even if they are risky, especially if they're falling. You get any of these guys in the second round, I think that's a great pick. You get them late in the first round if you're a contender. Like, if you're a Colorado, I'm not. I don't think Colorado has their first round pick this year, but if they did and they got him, got one of these guys, you know, 32nd overall, like that could be a great pick five years down the road. But you have to be willing to accept the fact that there's a good chance that any one of these guys or all of them even could not pan out. All right, guys, that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you do want to see that video I referenced at the beginning of the video, the one about guys that I think are safe picks in this upcoming draft, I will put that in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Go ahead and click on it, watch it. It's a good video, very similar to this one. And that being said, have a nice day.